Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, AGK Karunakaran. I go by my initial. I'm the uh, president of Thai Silicon Valley, or I'd uh, call myself volunteer in chief. Um, you know, Thai has been an organization that uh, fostered entrepreneurship, you know, right from the day it got started. You know, I've been a beneficiary of um, uh, when, when I was a regular member back in the 90s to, um, you know, progress towards my entrepreneurial journey. Thai has been a great support for me. And I've learned a lot of things through various sessions at Thai. Um, you know, my story today is one such session and you'll hear more about it from uh, Naveen Bish. Um, and as you can see from uh, uh, the background here, we're all getting ready for TaiCon. Uh, if you have not already registered, I strongly register that you uh, suggest that you register for TaiCon. Uh, today we'll have a wonderful session. My story session is about featuring very, very successful entrepreneurs. Um, and we'll hear from one pretty soon. Um, uh, you know, my story session itself has been chaired and, uh, you know, coordinated by Naveen Bisht. Naveen is a serial entrepreneur. He's been associated with Thai for a long time. He's uh, currently the CEO of Akrita which is an AI-enabled uh, cloud-based security startup company. Uh, before that, he has been CEO of multiple companies, Stark, Securac, uh, Nina Networks, and Ukiya Software. Um, he has also been the previous uh, board member of TIE and chaired multiple programs. Uh, you know, we are fortunate to have him uh, lead this particular effort. We know my story has been a fairly well-attended program. So welcome, Naveen. Please take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you, AGK. Appreciate it. Uh, so uh, first of all, good evening, everyone over here in, in the US and this part of the world. And then uh, the good morning to number of attendees who attend from India and other that side. So hope you all are doing well. And uh, so a couple of items before we get started. Number one, there's a, on the chat section, please uh, get your questions ready. I'm sure you must uh, that you want to ask Manish in the Q&A section later on, which we will start in 20 to 30 minutes. And so, and we'll try to see that we can answer all the questions within the time frame we have here and uh, that Manish uh, may want to do. All right, so with that, let me get started. We have an amazing speaker today. So the question is, uh, one of the things when you start any company, you uh, as an entrepreneur ask yourself, how do you create a huge company in a, with a, which is there in a huge opportunity, which has a huge opportunity, I'm sorry. So how do you create a leading social marketplace where selling and marketing is, are simple, social and sustainable? So this is the vision Manish had when he founded uh, Poshmark in 2011. And now nearly a decade later, Poshmark and its community of 70 million registered users are thriving. Not only that, just a few months ago in January, Manish led a successful initial public offering of his company, listing it on NASDAQ under the symbol POSH, P-O-S-H. And as of market close today, the market cap was $3.5 billion, which is a huge accomplishment and kudos to Manish and the team for creating such a huge shareholder value. Under his leadership, Manish has applied over 20 years of his experience in building and scaling companies to create this social marketplace that combines the human connection of a physical shopping experience with scale, reach, ease, and the selection benefits of e-commerce. And prior to Poshmark, Manish was uh, founder and CEO of uh, Kaboodle, which was an online shopping website that was acquired by Hearst Communication in 2007. And earlier in his career, Manish held executive positions with Versant, Versata, and Sybase, uh, which was eventually acquired by uh, SAP. Manish holds an MBA from Haas Business School at UC Berkeley, MS in computer science from Uri Austin, and has a BTEC degree from IIT Kanpur. 
So without taking too much of thrill from Manish's amazing story, I would like to hand it over to Manish to share his exciting, colorful, and amazing entrepreneurial and professional journey. And let's give him a virtual applause. So Manish, here you go. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you for having me. And thank you, AGK and Ty, for hosting uh, this uh, virtual session of my story. Um, for those of you who are joining from different time zones, uh, good evening, good morning, uh, and, and whatever the time zone is, uh, really happy to have you here. Uh, I wanted to start out by really uh, taking a step back and, and sharing you know, how I think about the core values that power Poshmark. But even before I go there, I wanted to just share what is Poshmark and, and, and what do we do? So Poshmark is a social marketplace, which makes it very easy for anyone to buy, sell, engage with each other around fashion. And we've expanded it to have home and beauty and most recently pets. Uh, Poshmark operates in the United States, Canada, and we most recently uh, launched in Australia. So we think of the world as a place we are trying to bring closer to the world of commerce. And in so many ways, we are also trying to bring that human connection back into shopping that is missing in the online world. So I'm gonna have, uh, I wanna just share a couple of slides as we, as we go through this discussion. Uh, so you have a chance to sort of uh, hear a little bit about the journey uh, as well. So for me, the two things that have really led my entire life from the very beginning and are the foundation of creating Poshmark and values that guide Poshmark as we scale it and also the community that surrounds us is number one, embracing your weirdness and number two, leading and really embracing love as a core value that drives everything. One of the things we talk about in our company often is if you start with love, money follows, but if we start with money, nothing follows. And that's something that's very embedded in our thought processes. Even as we started the company in my garage all the way where we've taken it public and now we are operating it as a public company today. So let me step back and share a journey that for many of you who've immigrated here in US, you may be able to connect to, for people who are joining from around the world, you'll probably also be able to share it. I grew up in India, I grew up in UP, I grew up in towns all over UP. My father was a judge. Um, I, I was in Dehradun, I was in Allahabad, I got actually married in Dehradun. Uh, and, and, and various towns. I, uh, because of the movement, I was able to actually sometimes get where I could finish a grade in half a year or a year. So I finished my high school at the age of 15 and got admitted into IIT. And uh, one of the funny things about the IIT journey is that when I was applying to colleges, my father asked me, you know, where do you want to go to college? I said, I want to go to IIT Kanpur and computer science. And IIT Kanpur computer science took 15 kids. And he kept asking me like, are you gonna to apply to other colleges? And he forced me to offer to one of the colleges. But in my mind, I was very determined that either I was gonna to go to this specific program, I'm gonna sit a whole year and apply to the program again. Luckily, I was the last kid they took in into that batch. So, so my father was lucky I didn't have to sit at home for the whole year. And, uh, and I started my journey at IIT Kanpur. I finished IIT Kanpur in 1987 and made my way to US and, and joined UT Austin, uh, which itself was a fun experience. I was doing, uh, I'd enrolled for my PhD in computer science there. Uh, I also immersed, I was only 19 when I came to this country. I also immersed myself very much in the campus life. I was involved in many, many activities. One of the activities I undertook in UT Austin was actually participating in the local Mexican dancing uh, club and we actually got to perform uh, an amazing set of Mexican dances in college on the states of Austin capital. So if you can imagine an Indian guy in uh, 87 dancing at the steps of Austin, Texas uh, state capital, that kind of tells you how interesting the world was back in the 80s. Today, you know, when we think of capital and capitals, we think of some other sort of conjuring of images. It was much more pleasant and peaceful at that time. Uh, and, and, and there was a lot of co-mingling across cultures uh, as, as it is in campuses. I actually decided that I was gonna finish with masters and didn't want to pursue PhD, but wanted to jump in the working world. So in 89, I transitioned from UT and uh, got a job with Intel in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, and then eventually I also got my MBA uh, from UC Berkeley. 
So my career journey actually started in the midst of a semiconductor company, which is Intel, but I was building databases for them. And in those days in 89, for all of those who are on the tech side and the database side, uh, Oracle was barely in existence. Sybase had just sort of uh, emerged on the scene. And a lot of the databases that the companies were using, they were actually building the whole stack of databases, starting from vSAM, iSAM file software and really creating the databases. Uh, and after a year, I realized that this world is gonna get replaced with, um, with a lot of uh, tech that is being packaged like Sybase and Oracle. And I looked around and I said, you know, the best technical stack I could see was Sybase. Uh, Sybase also happened to be near Berkeley. So I said, I'm gonna apply to these companies. I applied to Oracle, Ingress, Sybase. Uh, Sybase actually got referred to someone, many of you might know, which was Raju Reddy. And Raju Reddy and I have a very interesting connection at that time because Raju held the same role that I got recruited into and he'd moved on. So as I connected with him, and this is really the power of networks that Silicon Valley has, that your company networks, college networks, cultural networks that bring the power. He's the one who actually referred me into Sybase and that's how I got my opportunity at Sybase. Um, I joined Sybase and uh, they started to apply for my H1 and very shortly, I got a call from Sybase recruiter saying, you know, hey, we just laid off 15% of the company. Little did I know we were going through the first recession I was gonna see in Silicon Valley, but you still have your job because I was you know, a freshman engineer and they had probably laid off more expensive people. So you can still come. And you know, being the green uh, and blue eyed, you know, sort of just not, not knowing anything, I decided to leave the secure job of Intel and join this 80 person startup called Sybase, uh, which had just laid off 15% of the thing when I joined, the CEO was talking about you know, operating on venture debt and they didn't, hadn't been able to secure funding. I didn't quite process it, uh, but I was just you know, enjoying myself. Now that I think about it, it was a terrible thing. I joined a secure company to join a company that didn't have funding, was operating on venture debt, had lived, laid off 15%, uh, but sometimes you know, being naive is a good thing. So I joined them and things turned around and we actually ended up taking the pub company public and I saw the company grow from 80 to 6,000, achieved a lot of career growth, finished my MBA, uh, even made a little bit of money in the stock market with Sybase stock to, to buy our first home, met my wife at that time. So it was an amazing year. And then I got recruited through some of my colleagues at a company called Versada. As I was joining Versada, I had all of the Sybase colleagues, but also there was a complication. The CEO of that company was my father-in-law. So I had to think through, do I join this company with that family connection or not? Uh, ended up just really liking the vision they were after, what they were chasing, really believed in it. Certainly, you know, obviously had a lot of respect. And I ended up joining Versada uh, at, at, when they were like eight people. And we grew that company and took it public in 2000. It was an amazing journey. We had to pivot a few times. We saw the dot-com boom, saw the stock go up, come down. Uh, and I left Versada in 2001. At that time, you know, when I sort of, between 2000, 2001, something to remember as we look at the next few years, the interesting thing and the powerful thing about that time was that we saw the stock market hit crazy highs and then crazy drops. And it's something we all forget that as we are going through this stock market high, there can be crazy drops. However, the long-term value creation in engines don't go away. So in that crazy drop, the valley became, went from a booming market where there was just too many jobs to a place there were almost no jobs here. You literally could drive on 101, speed through it, and unlike COVID, there were see-through buildings, not because of COVID, but because there were just no jobs. Engineers were abandoning cars in the lots and, and moving back to India. And there was this meme that we will never have engineering boom in, in, in US and all the jobs will shift to India. And I remember attending one of the Thai cons and there were two uh, granddaddies who were sort of, uh, of, of Silicon Valley. One was uh, Don Valentine, who was the founder of Sequoia Capital. And the other was Regis McKenna, who was the chief marketing officer of Intel having a dialogue and they put up all these headlines, Silicon Valley is no more, everyone's abandoning Silicon Valley, people are leaving, put on another headline. And it felt like the headlines were coming from 2001, but really they were from 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990. So every 10 years, we sort of predict the demise of Silicon Valley, except it comes back in new forms with new technology, making cars, making drugs as Moderna vaccine, what have you, inventing music and film and phones. So. The way I kind of think about it is this innovation cycle that takes us forward is really uh, what captures us. On my personal front, that was the time I started to really get engaged in consumer. We were remodeling our home and that led to my first startup, Caboodle. When I thought of the idea of Caboodle, I kept asking myself, what is this enterprise software guy who spent his time selling software, 
selling to enterprises, doing thinking of a consumer thing. So I said, no, 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 you can't do it. Kept putting the idea aside, kept putting the idea aside, kept putting the idea aside. But the idea wouldn't let go. It became a burning fire. I kept dreaming of it. I felt like I'd solve world hunger with that idea. And so the approach I took was really to start to assemble a team of people who could come from real life. So they were people that I could bring in who were advisors. So I drew into Thai network. I drew into IIT Kanpur network. I drew into my Berkeley network. And I was able to assemble a group of folks who were amazing, both advising me and around me. And they included Professor Motwani, who was, as you know, was sort of one of the early uh, people who mentored the people who founded Google. Ashish Gupta was a co-founder of Jungli. Uh, I was able to also in my network bring in people like Reid Hoffman who were also developing a company at that time called LinkedIn. And so build this network through just organic talking to people, pulling them in, et cetera. And also started to spend my time with an organization that helped me connect with people, which was Thai. And that was the foundation of the early days of Kaburu where I switched from enterprise software to consumer. And that journey started in 2004, 2005. And uh, Kaboodle actually, we were uh, acquired by Hearst Corporation in 2007, very early on. For those of you who are not familiar with Kaboodle, think of Kaboodle as really a predecessor to Pinterest. What we were doing there were really helping people collect links and visual links, organize them, and then people could shop those links. It was a so first generation of social shopping but we weren't taking any transactions. It was more like a magazine. And so Hearst bought it as a visual digital magazine to integrate with their properties. I spent a couple of years there. And those four or five years for me personally were really my transformation to go from enterprise software to becoming much more immersed in consumer, in fashion, and really seeing my passion for community, which was always there, whether it was my service to Thai growing up, really blossom and allowed me to sort of say, what do I want to do? And all of that ultimately led to the creation of Poshmark. So when we think of Poshmark, we think of it as a social marketplace, really started with fashion, but today we broadened to home, to beauty, to pets. And the journey I had, sort of the early idea of Poshmark was conceptualized in 2009. I was sitting at the back of my head but a lot of pieces that were needed to really conceptualize Poshmark were not available in 2009. So if you, if you can take your memories back from 2021, from 2009, and you know, no matter what your age is, in 2009, 2008, iPhone had just launched. It was in its early incarnation. If you were to look at an 08 iPhone, uh, it, the form factor was sort of similar to the form factor we see today, maybe a little smaller, but everything was very grainy. The pictures were grainy, the display was very grainy. It didn't have the high intensity display. Uh, and the pictures were kind of crude. So it was, it was a nice to have, you know, you could take some live pictures, but it wouldn't be something that would compare to your SLR or high quality photos. Uh, and the storage was very small. iCloud had not been born. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of uh, limitations here to back up by attaching to a laptop. So laptop was still the king, the phone was just emerging. And so as I was leaving uh, Caboodle and Hearst, I started to think that things I wanted to do was I wanted to create something in fashion. I wanted to be something where love led and commerce followed. At Caboodle, one of the challenges I had was because it was a media site, we were doing love, but then we had to sell advertising, which kind of interfered broadly with love and sort of created all kinds of issues. And then the third thing is I wanted to create a team and be surrounded by a team in fashion that understood fashion and certainly had a team that understood technology. So I set out to say, I wanna find a co-founder who really understands fashion, not just understands fashion at a surface level. And I started to meet with people very intentionally. Ultimately through this process, which I would say is founder dating in a very intentional way, I ended up meeting Tracy, which was introduced, who was introduced to me uh, through Mayfield. And uh, when Tracy and I met, we just felt like it was really a great union because both of us were looking for exactly the kind of things that made sense to each other. Uh, and that click led to really the creation and recreation of that idea around Poshmark. And then I pulled in the team that really had led to Caboodle success, which was Chetan and Gautam, who were both the core technologists and product development and sort of engineering leaders from, from Caboodle. And luckily I was able to bring this team together and Naveen at Mayfield decided to really be the lead investor and, and fund this journey. Now, if you go back to 2010, when we were looking at it, the, 
catalyst for the idea was iPhone 4. iPhone 4 had the high retina display, had sort of the high thing. And I decided that really, if I'm going to do any uh, company, it has to be on mobile. So I wanted to do it 100% focused on mobile. In order to do that, in August, um, just right on the time at Matrasi, I decided I'm going to basically give up all of my laptops and all of uh, anything that's desktop and laptop oriented, and I'm going to live my entire life on mobile. So on an iPhone and an iPad, everything, banking, Excel, spreadsheet, Word, which was really hard at that time, but it was doable. And for so six months, I did everything. I didn't use the laptop at all uh, or desktop for six months. And that convinced me that this technology is really ready uh, to be built on. The second thing that happened at that time was I started to see that people were really embracing secondhand fashion and used fashion. I was at my son's high school homecoming game and I saw that the homecoming queen was wearing this beautiful yellow dress, but she had thrifted it. This is back in 2010. And then the third thing was I surrounded myself with an amazing team and an amazing group of people that gave me the confidence that I could really build this company. And so all of that clicked together and started to create Poshmark as a mobile social marketplace. And we bet the farm on just doing an iPhone. We had social, in fact, the first six months, we didn't even have search in the platform. Uh, so we just really focused on that and intended that to be the case. The second thing we did was very early, we knew we wanted to engage with the community and the users. And so within a couple of months of building the product, we started to actually have live events where we would invite people. Uh, and the vision was that at these, these, these are what have become our posh parties. We would invite people at that time, we were focused 100% on women. And the goal was to invite women at five o'clock, have them bring a few items from their closet and show them how to list. Now, if you go back to 2011, most people didn't have a phone that was capable of taking pictures. They mostly had flip phones. So that was a big problem. You know, we would invite them, didn't have a phone. So we could take their pictures with their phone, but they couldn't even have the app. So what we ended up doing was we ended up going out and buying a hundred devices, which at that time were called um, uh, iPod Video was the name. Gosh, I'm starting to fade away in terms of the name. It was this old device, which looked like an iPhone. It didn't have cell phone, but you could do all of the work. So the app could be loaded. And, uh, and we started to give it to people on a loaner, although almost none of them came back to us. And we used that to create an initial beta network by supplying them with the hardware, arming them with the pieces and starting to teach them, teach them what they do. Now, what we realized that these events as unscalable as they were, were really powerful catalyst for people to learn to take photos, start to do transactions. We didn't have any payment built into the app. So our, VP of, our current VP of community was our community manager at that time would facilitate these transactions that looked like mini drug deals. It'd be like people meeting up, taking a little bag, giving to each other, cash trading hands, et cetera. And really what they were doing was trading, you know, giving skirts and dresses and, and whatnot and building that whole thing out. But we started to build a mini community, both here and remotely, who were logging in, trying to do these things. And then I had the idea of really converting these things into a virtual posh party. And so we said, okay, how do we do it? So Tracy and Leanne went out and started to market these posh parties through Facebook groups. And we said seven o'clock the party would start, but there was no technology. It's just that if people logged in at seven o'clock, they would put a picture of a yellow post-it note on a wall, say, hey, this is, the, this is the dresses party. Take a picture, load it up and put that photo into the app. And that became the dresses party. Everything out of them was a dresses party. And there was no search. So you have to just literally sit there and scroll. And we started to get emails from people who were sitting in their homes across the country and literally scrolling through, looking at every item, talking to each other because we had communications built in uh, and, and starting to do some basic transactions. And that was the genesis of really starting out the journey. And we said, this Posh Party thing is really key. So we delayed the release by two months, redid the product around the Posh Party and launched it in December 11. Uh, at that time, Within first month, we had about a thousand users. Second month, we had 1500 users because there was no real mobile growth engines. So we went back to the physical event and started to throw physical events across the country, LA, San Antonio, Dallas, and really started to grow our company uh, and community very organically. And it started to blossom and, and grow. And then by fall, we started to use traditional paid marketing and scale it. Uh, and then in that sort of fall of 11 to 12, came the first big growth spike where we saw from 12 to 13, uh, mobile install got born, Facebook advertising and Facebook mobile install happened. So we grew 10X in that time frame. So 2012 to 2013, we grew almost 10X. In that 10X growth, 
things were just amazing. Things were happening. Everyone, community was joining, uh, people were happening. But the problem that we saw was that things were breaking because our system was not built to scale at that level. Uh, the growth engines were not scaling because some of the growth was coming from paid marketing. So the, what you call lifetime value to customer acquisition cost was going downhill. And literally everything from payments to transportation to technology to postal service, all was breaking because we had suddenly taken a volume that was built for very low volume and taken it almost 10 to 15 X. So we had to take a breather, which was a hard thing to do in a venture funded company is how do you sort of deliberately slow down growth? And I had to go to the board, which at that time was Menlo and Mayfield and really present my case to say, I wanna really cut down marketing for a few months and, 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 and build out the infrastructure, do all of these pieces to, to scale the growth. A very difficult discussion. I had great support from my investors, took marketing down 80% at that time and used that time to really rebuild the infrastructure, build the things. And that's where you see the core cohorts of Poshmark really started to shine because the core customer cohorts, as we've shared in our S1, continued to stack up and grow for Poshmark. And that's the power of community. They built such a strong community. They were so engaged. They were spending so much time on the platform, supporting each other, sharing story, connecting with each other, uh, sharing each other's items, curating, meeting up in physical life. We um, had the courage to use some of those dollars to really host our first conference called PoshFest in 2013. I remember 240 people flying in from across the country, really feeling so thrilled with meeting each other, hugging each other, coming together. Uh, and that started the journey of really scaling this community to the next level. In 2014, after six, eight months, we were able to recraft these partnerships and we started scaling and just kept growing uh, from that point onwards uh, for the next many, many years. And there were many different points of inflection. We had a point of inflection around um, category expansion. In 2016, GGV had just invested. And one of the things that were pushing us was really expanding it to go beyond uh, women and look at different categories. So we launched kids and men's and there was a lot of trepidation on launching men's because we were such a powerful and wonderful uh, women's community. And to our surprise, the men and kids, especially men's category just took off and it became a big growth driver. And today men are very much part of our community as, as are women. In 2018, 2019, we took the leap of faith to really expand our categories beyond fashion. We launched home and beauty uh, last year and sort of that year. And then the second thing we did at that time was also launched international. And again, to our surprise, we seeded the community with, uh, with a few people and Canada as a market just took off. So what we found is that our paradigm of social marketplace has three things. Number one, it's pretty universally applicable. Number two, it harkens back to how shopping was done. So to me personally, for those of you who have visited Delhi, I grew up going to my grandfather's pharmacy in Chandni Chowk and spending time there. Even when I was a little kid, eight, nine years old, roaming around, seeing people haggle, bargain, that human engagement in, in online is sort of really missing. And then the second thing that online brings is access to massive inventory. We have hundreds of millions of items on the platform, easy shipping, easy access from home, something that really powered our experience in COVID times as a humanity, as a community. So we want to marry the two things. And that's really the vision of Poshmark is to bring that social commerce, that social element into the heart of shopping. And particularly for areas which are style-based, taste-based, fashion, home, it really creates a very different experience and then the last thing was sustainability and really empowering people to take all this waste, all this energy and effort trapped in their homes and use that to craft a journey, not just a journey as a shopper, but journey as a seller, as an entrepreneur. And the amount of entrepreneurs that we continue proud of that are being created in Poshmark, where people are taking their journeys, paying for their families, creating a second income, working their way out of poverty, working their way out of domestic abuse, using Poshmark as a means to grow and thrive creating new brands, creating new designers is just overwhelming. And those are the side benefits of creating this amazing ecosystem, which really has become the mainstay of what we are focused on. Uh, in fact, we've just launched a fund called Heart and Hustle Fund, uh, which empowers our community to really take their game to the next level, gives them mentoring tools, gives them scholarships, gives them other things to really help them scale their business. Whether you're a small seller trying to become medium or you're a medium seller trying to become big, it really supports that journey at various stages. Uh, we also want to continue to grow globally. We recently launched Australia 
uh, as a new country, the community has grown to over 70 million users. And the level of engagement that people have is that they spend over 27 minutes a day on the app. And that whole engine and, and, and thing powers this very organic growth engine uh, in the platform, which is supplemented with paid marketing to drive the ultimate growth. We have to do a second round of change in our marketing leverage, which was when COVID hit in Q1 of last year, we didn't know what the future would be. And again, we slashed our marketing spend by 80% uh, right then and there. And that allowed us to again see the power of our community, which came back strong, robust, uh, and, and really thrived in these times and supported each other, bought and sold. We've launched a lot of innovation in that time period. We've launched video, we've launched social engagement, and all of that has led to really thinking about how do you craft a human journey that goes through all of these stages? So for me, at each stage, it is about understanding where your next stage of growth is, next stage of vision is. And to me, in many ways, growth is really the true way for human happiness. So when I think about growth, I think about growth of not just the company, but you as an individual and your growth could be tied to a professional growth, could be tied to personal growth, could be tied to spiritual growth, but if you're growing, you're happy. And so thinking of those growth levels at which you can achieve is very powerful. Second thing, I truly believe that trapped inside any opportunity that you're pursuing, any opportunity that you're looking at is a massive opportunity. Even though you may think of that opportunity as small, once you achieve it, the next set of things unlock, the next set of things unlock, the next set of things unlock. I mean, if you were to ask someone who believed in me when we started to talk, create a platform for wind by used clothes in 2010, nobody could have believed not just the scale of Poshmark, but the scale of this industry and how revolutionizing it is in challenging traditional retail. In fact, almost every major brand and retailer today wants to add a secondhand section. Uh, Nordstrom wants to add a secondhand section. So when you start to think about the impact we've had on the global business, on sustainability, on humanity and human empowerment, it's pretty massive. When you start to think about people talking, conversing, posting photos, engaging in the open conversation that they do in Poshmark and, and driving it, it's pretty powerful. And the third thing is the principles we've adopted in the marketplace, for example, there is no public ratings. When you, when you finish with a transaction, you do a private rating, but you need a public love note. Building that trust in a very seamless way is very powerful. And then to get a massive operation like USPS to move in our direction and create Posh Post, uh, which is the country's first fashion shipping system, which is scaling. And you know, recently they gave us their growth uh, partner award of the year which tells you how we've crafted that partnership in a meaningful way, which is a win-win, win for our customers, win for the postal service and win for Poshmark, allows you to reimagine what that potential is. And I see a massive runway ahead for Poshmark as the world shifts to online, first shifts to social and the world shifts to secondhand, which allows us to create a place where anybody can thrive, whether you're buying, selling, connecting, or just browsing and shopping. And most recently we introduced video shopping in the platform which allows people to engage in a, in a deeper way. The, the final thing I wanna say is that a journey can really take different turns and, and, and processes. For me, a software engineer, a techno guy out of IT Concord to be focused on women's fashion, to really be building a very emotional product required a lot of leaps of faith and development. I had to think differently. One of my mentors said, you know, when you're building a consumer software product, you have to stop thinking just of productivity and tune into what human emotion is, where you're going. And it required pretty deep intention to move in that direction. And to the point that, you know, I had to almost leave some of my database roots and other things behind, bring my techno knowledge, but also seep into culture, into human understanding, et cetera, and build on that. And that required several years of growth, uh, but I was committed to it. I wanted to do it. And now it's sort of very second nature to me, but at that time it was harder uh, to the point that I don't think my daughter even believes that I ever programmed any kind of code um, in, 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 in my history because she thinks, you know, this dad is so focused on fashion and pop culture that he, you know, how could he have sat on the committee for NC, uh, SQL back in 92. So that journey tells you that you can take literally any journey you choose to, you can intend it. Uh, the final thing I wanted to also share before I wrap up here is uh, a couple of the techniques I use in terms of my daily routine to manage my life, to manage uh, my vision and to manage my goals. So 
one of the things I say, a goal that is not written, uh, a dream that is not written, uh, when you sort of don't know what your end game is, is something that's much harder to achieve. So if you think of begin with the end in mind philosophy, I always write down very specific, very vivid vision of what the future holds. So for example, when we started the company, I wrote down in 2011, what December of 2012 would look like, how a package would be coming, how a, 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 an imagined user, Julie, would be taking photos, et cetera. In 2011, I wrote down what 2013, 2014 would be looking like. And, and the funny thing is when you write it down in very specific ways on what the future holds and the pieces are there, it manifests, it becomes reality. Um, I think in 2018, June, I wrote down a vision which involved Poshmark becoming a public company with a certain sort of approach where it was listed, what was happening, certain countries that were launched. In 2018, we hadn't even started working on Canada. We certainly were far from being a public company. And when I look at January of 2021, all of those things have become reality, everything we wrote down. So I would highly encourage you to very vividly, very specifically write down where you want to go. Imagine that you will get there and then use your effort and, and, and energy to get there. Second thing is the journey has to be the reward in the sense that what you will often find is that when you reach a destination, that destination becomes a starting point for the next journey. So you have to enjoy this piece. It's easier said than done, but you have to make sure for longevity and sustainability, you have to create that balance across the board. Of course, entrepreneurship is not balanced, but you have to create some balance to kind of enjoy the pieces. Life cannot just be put on hold as you're going through this, but at the same time, this will become your life. And third thing is you need to be able to manage yourself, whether it's stress management, et cetera. For me, one of the things that I like to do is both read and meditate. Uh, and those two things have been very, very uh, core part of me managing long-term sort of personal well-being and stress as I've gone through these journeys and ups and downs that come. So um, overall, you know, it's been an incredible journey and uh, it's been supported very well by Thai, by my college alumnus, by my family. Uh, certainly my wife uh, has suffered through many nights as I've gone through the suffering. Uh, certainly my kids have been very involved, my family, my mom, my father-in-law. So really the whole tribe that comes together uh, is the key. It's the power of team, the power of te technology and power of emotion that brings it together. Uh, so I wanna leave you with this final quote from Steve Jobs. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you will know when you find it. Thank you again. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Manis. Really appreciate the uh, amazing story. So let me start with the first question. And we have a number of questions from the audience. Uh, so, you know, I was uh, reading the podcast you had done with your alma mater, Haas Business School. And one of the things which picked me was you mentioned while um, you used to watch you at your grandfather's wholesale shop, deals being made every day. And so I was wondering as you're growing up, uh, was that the catalyst that kind of inspired you, your entrepreneurial curiosity to make a change from your you know, successful professional career and jump into the wild west of entrepreneurship? I certainly think my grandfather was, a, was a, a definitely a big influence. You know, I think, uh, being in the Valley, sort of being exposed to different entrepreneurs, including my father-in-law, some of the mentors we ha I had along the way was also very powerful. Uh, some of the influence on shaping Poshmark and thinking about social commerce and, and blending the two things definitely emanated when I have memories of real sort of haggling, et cetera. And, you know, as a kid to get exposed to that level of a marketplace, because my grandfather would just take us there and leave us. So we'd just be roaming around his large shop and it was not a retail pharmacy, it was wholesale. So it was like a lot of boxes, you know. So that, that, that whole sort of freedom to explore, which is hard to do today with the kids, was really catal catalytical in terms of internalizing how human interactions impact shopping. And that was, you know, more subconscious than conscious. Yeah, so that's yeah, a very good story though. Um, so let me start with the first question from the audience uh, from Aubrey Aloysius. Um, I'd like to ask, please share your journey of acquiring the first hundred customers and then scaling to the first thousand customers. You kind of referred to it, but if you want to elaborate more. 
Sure. So, so very simply, the first hundred customers were really hand to hand. You know, it was really built. You know, we would go to San Francisco state fashion shows and hand out cards. We would, you know, go to events. My co-founder, my uh, head of community, would go out to events, hand out cards to just come to these physical events that we were hosting, which we hosted once or twice a week, and that would be the place where we would really show them how the technology worked, how the app worked, or give them an iPod video if they showed the commitment to really uh, be there. So it was built very organically. The next thousand customers was really those people spreading the word, us putting the app in the app store, doing a little bit of PR, we got to that thousand. After that, it took physical events to get to the next few thousand people. And then we started a little bit more structured paid marketing at that point in time. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, second question from Atul Kumar. Um, any role uh, your IIT, UT Austin, um, Berkeley alumni networks played in starting and scaling your startup? I know you, you had mentioned earlier that you kind of took advantage of all your, you know, these school and cultural networks in your time, yeah. but you want to elaborate um, more? So the IIT network uh, and the Thai network were really foundational in some of these creations. So when I think of uh, tapping into it, I think many of the folks who are investors or uh, who came on my board came from my alma mater, which is IIT Kanpur or different IITs or uh, Thai. That was sort of a very pivotal part. I think UC Berkeley really helped me draw in a lot of the talent uh, and UT Austin, I think, was somewhat involved, I think, because of the geography, it was not as intensely involved, although that has been a great network as well. So the, I would say the college networks and the Silicon Valley tie networks were really key in both the companies in creating the foundational and sort of the ecosystem and, and just directly and indirectly recruiting. For the second company, Poshmark, you know, I obviously built a company. Uh, and so I could draw on a lot of the second order networks that were created. But for the first company, these two networks were crucial. Uh, alumni network and the tie. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Ashok. In in our journey, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I guess that's what he's asking. How to know we are on the correct path and when to pivot? I think uh, two things. One is you have to start with that very internal belief that you are focusing on something that's coming from your heart. Uh, it has to come from a sense that you're trying to solve something big and you have to feel that you're trying to solve something big. There are different kinds of entrepreneurs, bottoms up who can see the problem sort of derived from it, top down who see, you know, uh, gaps in the, in the marketplace and can create solutions. Both are, are, are fine approaches, but ultimately they have to converge. If you're starting from here, you have to get empathy from your customers. If you're starting for customers, you have to sense where the market plays out and how does it fit in the market? That's one thing. Second thing is, have you been able to build a small tribe around you? Have you been able to recruit a few people outside your first degree network to, to be committed to you, either as investors, advisors, or employees? Uh, that's important because if you can't convince anybody to join the early stage, then you are either not, you're likely not articulating what you're thinking, right? Less about the ideas. You have not sort of found that thing second. And third thing is, have you started to see early customers and consumers that you're working with, which varies if you're looking at a consumer play uh, the focus has to be engagement. You have to really focus on, are your customers engaging with the platform? Are they engaging deeply? Are they retaining? What is sort of your cohort shape looks like? When you're an enterprise, you have to get those proof of pilots, pilots, and then ultimately turn them into the same kind of cohorts. But that early pilot is really important because you can have the conversation. So slightly different ways, but both are really important to get that early traction, uh, to get the sense of validation. Great. Uh, next question is from uh, Sunmeet. Jolly. Uh, question is about how did you raise first round of capital? But I wanted to add something to that also. If I recall, maybe I'm, you know, if I'm correct, uh, I remember in your first company, I think you had uh, just raised from angels and you sold it very successfully, very fast. I don't think you went to the VCs. And so maybe you can elaborate on that as well. And in, when you started Poshmark, of course, Naveen Chadda was there with you but the difference and maybe some learnings and insights that could- Absolutely, I mean, I think it's a really, really good point. I would say for Poshmark, you know, Naveen, Chadda and I had known each other at that time for six, seven years, we had partnered and, you know, uh, so that, that funding story was very different because the truth is once you have the, the kind of partnerships in the Valley and you've had some success, it gets easier to get that next round of funding. But even at that time, I would say, I would credit Naveen a lot to believing an area which seems so weird at that time, mobile, fashion, 
selling consumers used fashion. You know, it seems so intuitive today. It's like so big. It just made sense at that time. It was hard. Uh, so you had to believe in me at that time and believe in the team I was putting together uh, and certainly like the idea, but it was more about the team and the belief. When you go back to the first company, Caboodle, it was a different world. It was much more uh, really tapping into and putting yourself 100% out there uh, because that angel money is really about you and your idea. And the idea is, is, is useful, but really it becomes about you. So I had to raise that money from angels, from people who I knew, people who I'd worked with, people who are sometimes even family and, and use that to cobble up the early round. And, and, you know, as it happens with these rounds, people committed to X and then X became 0.5X. The capital in 2005 was very, very scarce. You know, what used to be a seed round today, I don't know what you'd call it a seed round <laughs> at that time. That's true. Uh, and, and, and it was very, very small amount. In fact, many of the people who put money at that time have gone on to raise hundreds of million dollars of fund. At that time, they were investing literally out of their pocket. Um, so, so it was a very different time. But ultimately we kept going. And one of the things we had sort of decided as a founding team was we will not take any paycheck till our seed money reached a critical milestone and then we'll only take the paycheck. So my assurance to the investors was, yes, we'll close it. We won't take a paycheck till we hit a critical thing. So again, it was built a lot on trust. The second thing I believe is that you should always be closing. As an entrepreneur, you should always be closing. So if you get people believing it, I would try to close it as quickly as possible. Again. Right now, capital is quite fluid and there's a lot more capital available, but these capital cycles come and go. As an entrepreneur, you should always be closing. I should not take capital for granted as you go through these cycles and, and, and scale it. Uh, so the first thing was much more angel uh, oriented. We did it as a convertible. Second was we were going to do it as a convertible, but ended up just doing it as a price round because the idea, everything concretized, team concretized. So Naveen and I decided to just do it as a price down. It was a different ball game because I had definitely uh, more belief at that time and, and, and different pieces. The amount of capital that we raised and the support we got from Mayfield was pretty unique. So Mayfield has been a partner in terms of connecting us to someone like Tracy who became my co-founder, but then also supporting us through the various ups and downs that have happened. And I'm grateful to all of my investors from that perspective, inventors, GGV, Menlo, and now Tomasek, and, and many others, you know, Uncourt, who've been, who've been supporting in the journey. So you need, you need a lot of believers, and you have to keep educating them and making them believer. And now, as we become a public company, I have different investors. And again, you have to make sure that they're informed, they understand where you're taking the business, and within legal rules, what is your vision, where you're trying to go to, and be able to have the uh, uh, conversation with them. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, one of your investors who is our, my Bitsian colleague, Mukul Chawla from Temasek, he asked me to tell you hi yesterday. <laughs> so um, next question is um, uh, from Asis Agrawal. Um, obviously, he thanks you for, thank you for sharing such a wonderful journey. Can you share how you keep yourself and team motivated through it? Were there any points where you thought to move out? And, I didn't understand move out, but hopefully. Yeah, no, to, to leave the role and, and, and yeah. go. You know, it's a very, the entrepreneur journey is a very emotional journey. And I think at the end, if you are committed to a mission, that's how you can keep yourself focused. And there's definitely really, really deep lows. I remember many, many years back, seven, eight years back, one time just, it felt like every road was closed at the minute and we were going through a particularly rough time in the company. And I just didn't even know who I could share it with. So I just walked around the building, uh, outside the building and just cried, right? So those things happen along the journey. But quitting to me is never an option. I mean, I, I, just, I just never think of it. I think it has to be successful. It has to be there. The second thing is building a community-oriented social marketplace. That is just the customer you're serving is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And to me, serving our community is what gets me up every morning. Serving our team is what gets me up every morning. So motivating them getting them energized. And now we brought in another major constituency to our people of service, which is the public shareholder, besides the private shareholders that we had. So serving them. So really, if you keep a mindset of service, then you can really scale. And as Indians, I think that is one of the things that all the way from Mahatma Gandhi, you know, keeping that sort of mindset of service. And when people come to me for career and mentorship advice, I don't ask them what your passion is. I ask them, who do you want to serve? As long as you're serving the people that you want to serve, you can really enjoy it. <coughs> 
Naveen is the entrepreneurial community right now. I'm serving a different kind of entrepreneur, which is part of my community. Whoever you want to serve, as long as you can do that, that keeps you engaged and busy because that's really what we are doing in our life is we are in service of other people. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next question is from Sandeep Singh. Um, so wonderful st story, obviously, wants to thank you. And uh, can you say more about your decision to leave B2B, which I feel you kind of touched base in the beginning that somehow you couldn't sleep with this idea. But if you want to elaborate more, that's what you'd like to hear that I'm confident it was a tough decision. And how did you know it was time? Yeah, it was a really tough decision. And it was, it was something as I shared that I kept rejecting because I didn't feel capable of doing, doing this job, you know, being a consumer head back in, 2003, 2004, as I was conceptualizing this idea. But because the idea was so passionate, I decided to take that step. And the funny thing is that I recruited this kitchen sink cabinet, which was with me. And then, you know, some of them jumped on the full-time journey with me, including Chetan, who was with me in Kabudo and is here as my co-founder in both of those journeys. But some of the people I wanted to recruit were from consumer internet. And none of the consumer guys actually jumped into that first formation. So my strategy failed. All the guys who jumped in were enterprise guys. And the consumer guys ended up sort of thinking that the idea will never work, the idea of Kabuto. So we ended up reserving some of the founding equity and recruited a guy who I recruited through LinkedIn from Utah, who joined us as our consumer sort of uh, executive a few months down the road, who headed up products and, and biz dev for us because we needed that deep consumer person, but we couldn't find it from the people we knew because they just didn't believe in enough because they were too smart. So sometimes you have to go outside the industry, believe in yourself and then take that journey. Uh, and sometimes the people who are insiders may, may, not, may not sympathize with your idea or may not understand what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's just a great point you made, Manish. I mean, it's commendable with your background and all the, like I call you all the techie guys getting into the women's fashion in the beginning with the second, you know, uh, used, uh, you know, the selling, et cetera. I mean, it's amazing what you're able to do. So thank you and kudos to you again and the team. So next question is from Carolyn Cooksey. She says, what goal do you have for Poshmark? You know, we are really at the beginning of a very long runway at Poshmark. If you think about the space we are playing in, which is fashion, home products, and really, the amount of inventory trapped in our houses is trillions of dollars. When you aggregate all of that, the market opportunity ahead of us is, is huge. If you look at the trends that are happening, we are shifting to online. In fact, COVID, if you didn't have online, you probably didn't have a business. The second thing that's happening is that COVID and even before COVID, we craved online social, we create sort of social interactions, whether it's in, in case of social forms, but also really for commerce. And then the third thing, which is really a massive movement that's happening is around sustainability, focus on secondhand fashion. When you look at Poshmark, we're really at the intersection of these three things. And with our focus on really being an asset light model with built on technology, built on sort of the roots of where we come from and a massive community around us, we feel like we have a very long runway. We see ourselves growing globally. We see ourselves expanding across categories. We see us serving not just consumer sellers and professional sellers, but brands who can be part of the platform. And we continue to build new innovative features. Like if you look at what we've done with video, listing videos, posh stories, it really brings the heart of video commerce in a way that in some ways resembles what's happening in Asia, but in some ways it's really built for the US market in a way that is uh, what the US consumer wants. So really we continue to innovate, expand and scale in many different ways. That's awesome. Uh Next question is from Vida. Uh, tips on validating a startup idea for first time founders. What is the inflection point, if you want to elaborate on it? Yeah, I would say, um, depending upon the idea, the key thing is to focus on engagement. You know, if you're creating an idea, make sure that the people who use it and, and getting to that point really love it and they'll continue to use it. Doing market tests by just asking questions will only get you so far because people can't really visualize what you're talking about, if, especially if it's disruptive. If it's incremental, they can probably visualize it, but if it's disruptive, they can't visualize it. So you have to be able to figure out a way to build it and test it out with real people and sort of see what they're doing. Uh, and the number one metric, number one metric for me is engagement and retention, not growth, because growth can come, but engagement and retention uh, is there. In a way to think about is like right, money can come 
but love is natural. If you can create that love between your product and the customer, then that's where I would say you have an issue. So that data metric is important to, to measure that. The inflection points are many. You know, you'll have an inflection point where you've tweaked something and you're really starting to see that engagement perk up. You may tweak something and you'll start to see the growth perk up. And then of course you can do things which are more paid and that, that start to take you. So there'll be many different inflection points. In fact, the art of long-term growth is to continue to have multiple inflection times, inflection points periodically. Uh, in fact, over time, that first inflection point will feel so small uh, because as your, as your journey grows, and this is something that actually uh, a, a person who you might know is, you know, uh, Mike Spicer, who's behind Snowflake, painted this journey for me as, you know, as I was going through the exit decision, Kabul, he said, there are all these inflection points. And when you start to look at the inflection point here and look at the inflection point here, they start to fade away. So what you have to focus on is how do you get to the next inflection point, next inflection point. And then when you look at that 10x growth that you had in 2013, it feels so tiny. It feels like, oh, that was interesting. But that's something, you know, you grow in a day or a week at this point. So, so that's sort of the way I look at it as a continuous growth journey. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Ying Dai. He's from um, Stanford Business School. I have a question about the future strategy of Poshmark, kind of a little bit you elaborated. There are so many brands on Poshmark. I know the new market teams, new markets team is seeking to cooperate with various brands on the platform. How can Poshmark balance the competing interests of the individual sellers and brands? Yeah, I mean, it's really, really a great question, which is, as you're scaling a business and your customer base is coming from various perspectives, coming from individual seller, coming from people who are selling moderate amounts, people who are selling high amounts, and then you get people who have a lot more inventory are coming to the platform. How do you balance the platform? How do you sort of make sure it's attractive for everyone? And the core of it is really making sure that everything you're doing is fairly intentional and you keep growth engines for each person. And in fact, the way we kind of think about our business is we wanna support growth at each stage for our sellers, for our team, and for everyone else you know, who's surrounding the ecosystem. That mindset of continuous growth is how we approach every problem. So we want someone who joins the community to thrive. We want someone who's been here, who's leveled up their game to thrive, but we don't want there to be an end game. We want them to go from selling thousand dollars a month to tens of thousands, to hundreds of thousands, to hopefully one day there'll be people selling millions of dollars a month on the platform. So that's sort of that journey is part of the journey we want to support and that's the key. How we do that is by really keeping a very tight eye and focus on each of these customers and building things in a way that they serve different customers. And when there is a conflict, we have ways of resolving that conflict in the platform. Okay, thank you, Manish. Uh, next question from Sanjeev Moore. Um, it's great to hear about your success. And now that you have climbed the mountain, what motivates, drives you to take the company to the next level? Uh, a great question. I think, I think for me, I really see a massive opportunity ahead. And, and when I sort of think about what we can do and how we can impact, my vision is that one day there are people in Kenya who are selling stuff to people in New York. People in New York are buying stuff from people in Peru. And it affects the entire global economic ecosystem in a massively different way. If you can imagine a woman making handcrafted goods in, in fashion, in Kenya, selling them to somebody here and really being able to take care of her family or someone who's uh, you know, in Mongolia and this man is like building out products and selling it. I, I feel that we have an opportunity to really scale the economics of the posh marketplace, connect the world, world is much smaller than it used to be and really bring that human element into the heart of shopping in a very clear way. And that's sort of what motivates me because I feel like the work is not even in its first inning, there's so much to do. So uh, in a way, it doesn't feel like a mountain, it feels like a molehill and there's so much more to do ahead. Yeah, I do believe Manish, I think you have a huge opportunity and the almost open landscape ahead. Um, so uh, Manish, it's already seven. If you have time, there are 10, 11 more questions about another 15 minutes, or I don't know how your schedule is. Uh, I, can, you. I can stay till 7, 10, I mean, if you Okay, don't. Yeah. all right, that'll be awesome. I'm sure people will be very happy. Uh, so next question, I'll try to move it fast. Adhar Walia, he says, what do you see as the next big trend or catalyst in consumer commerce? I think it'll be very helpful for budding entrepreneurs. Yeah, I would say video. I mean, we really think that video is a huge area uh, that's happening. Uh, and, and video is just, you know, what you see today, but 
where you start to combine video with augmented reality and sort of other uh, aspects, I feel that is a whole area of innovation in, in, in commerce as we look at the next five or six years. Okay, all right. So next question is uh, from Sankar. Um, he says, uh, web, I think vsense.ai, that's, he's the founder, I guess. Um, what's your opinion on future of retail industry in USA and what are the changes you are seeing in shoppers behavior post COVID? Uh, my opinion is that retail industry is a very robust business and it will transform. And I think there will be transformation that we are going through transformation from uh, models that used to exist 30, 40, 50 years back that got changed 20, 30 years back that are going to get, that are in the process of getting changed now. So for example, if you look at a marketplace model uh, that we've built, those marketplace models are starting to really become a very dominant form of retail. And they are manifesting not just in marketplaces online, but they're also manifesting in physical marketplaces. And you see that when you go back to say Bergdorf, where it is kind of a virtual, mar a physical marketplace where you have a store by one of the brands, another brand, et cetera. So some of that stuff is happening. I see secondhand as be being very, very acceptable uh, to the mainstream uh, overall. And I see the future of retail as both mass market and niche at the same time, in the sense that people will be hyper-focused on serving very different communities, but at the same time, the underlying infrastructure could probably serve many, many different com communities together. So it's both mass market and niche at the same time. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is a very quick one. What's your suggestion on finding a right co-founder, which I think you went in Poshmark also you mentioned. Yeah, I would say spend time together, figure out like, even if you go to person and you feel like you're desperate to find this person, figure out a way to spend time with them, do project together, make some journey and have an entry and an exit plan. So every one of the people who joined my first journey, it was very clear to them what was the entry and what the exit plan. And I sort of told them, if we end up partnering and you're joining full time early on and you're a co-founder, we will share equity in double digits. If you end up just joining later on after we get the uh, capital, et cetera, you'll get equity, which may be more like a point or so. If you end up becoming advisors, 0.25%, et cetera. And here's sort of the, so just having clear conversations up front so there's no misunderstanding, but at the same time, spending the time together. And if the time is productive, making sure the person is compensated, creates transparency, trust, because the valley, the truth is the world we live in, it's all about relationships. And so you want to build relationships for the long term, not the short term. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's the number one aspect that you look for as a trait in all your employees? So I'm just adding it up to your co-founder thing by Yogi Chug. Um, I think uh, high intellect, high integrity, and a capability of really knowing what your own sort of weirdness and vulnerability is. So those are the three things we look for. Uh, next question from Dipti is, um, so what you have learned in your go-to-market retail business and what advice can you give, give to someone who's like to adopt it to a healthcare solution for chronic case issues that are rampant in our communities? Yeah, so, so for me, I think the biggest, um, one of the biggest things that we've focused on is really creating an authentic community around Poshmark. Our community is genuine, it's authentic, it's very real, it's connected, they support each other and it's been one of the joys of seeing them come together during COVID and, and help each other. Um, so to me, my biggest advice would be create an authentic community. And by that, what I mean is if you are really creating community to serve your customers and to help them and leave the power of it sort of blossom, which will help you drive growth, which will help you drive monetization, but do it in a, in a way that comes together that's powerful. Uh, community needs to have a purpose and it needs to have an action. And that purpose and an action is core for it to come together, particularly an online community. So purpose is easy to do. Action is where the innovation comes in and how to scale that community. Okay. Uh, and the next question from Rasmi Dev, is there a scope to preserve um, handicraft of various cultures, countries, any possibilities for Postmark to step in? Yeah, we do, we do see a lot of that happening on the platform. Um, honestly, it's an area that I think there is opportunity. Um, we, see, we see handicrafts, we see clothing coming from various cultures and, 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 and countries, and especially as we're going global, we're seeing more and more of that come on the platform. So there's definitely an opportunity uh, for that on Poshmark. Okay. All right. So I think I have a couple of more questions. Uh, so one is basically, 
I think those are more related to you. If your company gets acquired, so what would you do next? And uh, how do you see life after IPO? I think you have kind of answered some, in, uh, but if you'd like to say a little more on that side. Yeah, you know, when you think of a long journey, we've, we've been doing Poshmark for 10 years. Many of my team has been with me for 15 plus years. They've been on different journeys at Caboodle and Poshmark. Uh, Chetan and Gotham both joined the journey at Caboodle back in 0405. Uh, Vanessa, who heads up our product, joined us in 07, and she's been off and on with us for, for the last 14, 15 years. So there's a lot of people who are there. I feel like every few years you have to week a bit. It's almost like you're founding the company again. Uh, and certainly going public is a pretty major milestone. So you have to recommit and, and go through the process. So really figure out you know, where the energy is coming from. What are the mission? The mission of the company remains largely unchanged. So you have to kind of keep reminding them and the vision that we're taking to then really make sure that each person is energized about what they're trying to do, give them the fresh playbook. Uh, and that's sort of how you take it forward. So for me, uh, I think I've shared my commitment to the mission and sort of where I'm taking it. And I have that same dialogue with people around me to kind of help them scale and take it forward. Uh, one, uh, there's two more questions. So the second last is, what stage of product development or customer acquisition did you raise your first round of funding and then please share the challenges faced during this time and how you overcame them. This is from Aubrey LOCS. Yeah, so I'd probably a more apt analogy here would be Caboodle. I mean, I think um, it was very sheer persistence. We kept developing the product while we raised the money. We raised a small amount of money. Um, and then, you know, you just have to keep trying. We kept knocking on doors, kept knocking on doors. And ultimately, one door opened in a very big way. And that's sort of an interesting story in itself. And that helped sort of close that first round that we were trying to raise. And then we got oversubscribed. We we're trying to raise, I think, three quarters of a million or a million bucks. And we got oversubscribed and ended up raising 1.5 million. The, the numbers don't seem big, but at that time, it was like a king's ransom for us. It was like, wow. Uh, um, and so you just have to, have to believe, have to tap into your network and have to put yourself out there. Uh, the, the, the challenges in Poshmark have been different. I mean, there have been times where you know, we could get six of the metrics right, but two were not coming together. And certainly I'm probably not the visually the person who looks like, you know, you, you, you talk about, you know, raising money. And certainly as an Indian mid 40s, 50 CEO, you're probably not the right profile to raise money for a women's fashion company. So there was that, definitely that challenge in terms of, you know, coming from enterprise background and consumer, even after Kaboodle, even after doing for Poshmark for the years, there was definitely that issue. So the number of metrics we had to prove at each stage was enormous. And so there were many funding rounds where five out of the seven metrics were working, but because of two, we just could not get the right fit. So only when everything started to work was then we started to get interest uh, and, and people had to still be believers. Quite often what we found was that the lead investor who wanted to invest was very committed to Poshmark. But when they went to their partnership, partnership didn't understand. They didn't understand our business, they didn't understand me, they didn't understand how this guy could be doing this, et cetera. So there was all these confusion, et cetera. So the game of raising money and, and, and continue to build that never really stops. And it's there at each stage of the company, whether you're a private company, early stage private company, later stage private company, public company, you have to just get comfortable with the fact that if you're a CEO building a growth company, even if you're profitable, you're still raising money. If you're not profitable, you're still raising money. If it's early stage, you're raising money. You just have to get comfortable with the notion that money is something you want to continue to raise because you have to fuel. Now, it's not necessary if you want to just, you know, flat white out. In some cases, you know, there are times where are easy to raise money and there are times that are harder to raise money. But just that whole notion, you have to get comfortable with as, a, as an entrepreneur if you want to build high growth companies. Yeah, very good points. So one uh, question, uh, one more which got added to two and you have... Oh, to 710, so I'll just take one more minute. Um, Naren has a question, he says, Manish, can you give, Naren Bakshi, I think, can you give guidance to your entrepreneurs to make sure that they don't forget about your health and family and not just your company? Yeah, no, I mean, I shared that earlier. Uh, thank you, Naren is my father-in-law. Uh, the, 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 and he's very focused on health and wellness and he's really transformed his health over the last year and really become a role model for all of us. Uh, I think the, the key is, to create some routines that allow you to, to get back to health. I know it's very tough. A lot of entrepreneurs, including myself, have gone through the yo-yos. And for me, as I said, the two routines that really help me are books and meditation. For some people, it might be running. For some people, it might be uh, playing a game. But carving out just even a little bit of time is, is very useful. And of course, as you go forward, given that it's not a short journey, you have to make sure your health is intentioned along the way. 
I, I definitely echo that with you, Manish, because for the last almost 15 years, I've been doing meditation every day. I did 10 days silent meditation vipassana, and I, it just helps me a lot as an entrepreneur. And people wonder how you survive in the chaotic world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. So the last uh, the question I always ask is, any words of wisdom that you have for aspiring entrepreneurs, like with your background, like you mentioned a lot of things, right? Enterprise, middle-aged, and all those starting into this fashion, uh, e-commerce, if there was, they wanted to start in that area, what would be any words of wisdom? Imana. Well, I, I think I have advice from like three points that I've probably covered in this in this whole sort of process is what are the things that hold us back in an entrepreneur journey? Number one is fear, right? Fear of something. So how do you conquer fear? You, you conquer fear by creating a plan. The plan can be, hey, I'll do this for six months to nine months. Here's my savings. This is what I'm going to burn through. And then if I don't achieve these milestones, I'll de defocus. Quite often what ends up happening is if you don't have a plan and you don't stick to it, then you end up getting emotional, getting sucked in. And, and that can happen for many entrepreneurs that happens. But that's sort of one thing. The second thing is surrounding yourself with amazing people. People don't spend enough time doing it. Particularly, I, I find a lot of technology folks are so focused on the technology aspect of the business that they forget business is fundamentally about people. The third thing is selling, especially if you're coming from a strong technical background Sometimes you almost look at selling as a distasteful activity. And really, whether you are doing consumer like me or you're doing enterprise software you, or you're raising money, you have to get comfortable with selling because selling is really a way to express what you're doing, connect it to what the world wants, and then in that process, move your cause forward. So if you think of selling as not like, oh my God, I'm just sort of representing something, but really a way to move your mission forward and embrace it, then getting good at selling and evangelism is something you need to embrace and as you do, do that, you truly embrace your weirdness. And as you embrace your weirdness, you will thrive. So thank you, Naveen. This has been an honor yes. and a pleasure. Thank you all for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Manish. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you, everyone, attendees. I hope I covered all of your questions. Have a wonderful day, evening, day, et cetera. Bye-bye. Thank you. <coughs> bye, Ejike. Yeah, bye. It was great.